I've, I've spent my entire adult life studying John Calvin and Calvinism and the different isms within the, the sociological debate. And I'm either the daftest of men um, or um, I do understand it. And that's one of the reasons I've rejected it. And, and it may be the first, maybe I am just a daft human being. Um, and I might be convinced that that's true if it wasn't for the fact that I have uh, read so many very smart minds and very well-educated people on the subject who side with me on this issue. Not all Calvinists are the same. There's quite a sure. quite a bit of debate amongst Calvinists. Uh, and and I, I kind of hard it, find it hard and difficult to say, well, yeah, here's something against Calvinism. And then you end up talking for like, 15 minutes and then you realize the Calvinist you're talking to doesn't even believe that stuff. Um, can yep. we speak about kind of the different strands? I mean, I had a scholar on, um, who's been on our channel uh, a number of times, Dr. Carl Moser, and he, uh, he actually is reformed himself, but has a huge <laughs> issue with the sort of Calvinistic thinking that is popular today that he attributes to John Owen and his influence on modern yeah. American Calvinists, as opposed to Calvin himself. So he says, yeah. no, 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 go back and read Calvin, and the stuff you guys are saying, Calvin's not saying. Right? So yeah. um, so let, let's speak a little bit about that, because um, sometimes I find that Calvinists don't even know what they're talking about. They just kind of take, yeah. the, <laughs> take, the, take the title, but they don't know which camp they fall into. Yeah, I spend a lot of time trying to inform my Calvinist friends, what Calvinism is, um, because the, oftentimes they're there. And I've even debated men like Matt Slick and others who are good apologists in their own right, mm -hmm. but they even admit I, I've never read anything Calvin ever wrote and I don't care to. Um, and they're not even really based. They're not basing their Calvinism on what Calvin himself taught there. It's more of a, a, a label, a short kind of, kind of a thing to say, this is where I believe sociologically in general. Um, I, listen, I've, I've spent my entire adult life, studying John Calvin and Calvinism and the different isms within the, the sociological debate. And I'm either the daftest of men um, or um, I do understand it. And that's one of the reasons I've rejected it. And, and it may be the first, maybe I am just a daft human being. Um, and I might be convinced that that's true if it wasn't for the fact that I have uh, read so many very smart minds and very well educated people on the subject who side with me on this issue and have come to the same basic conclusions that I do. But one of the things that you'll always hear in these debates is, well, you just don't understand Calvinism. And what that really means is probably you're not representing my mm -hmm. particular strand of Calvinism because there are so many different brands of Calvinistic ways of thinking. Um, and even among, especially the doctrine of atonement that you were bringing with the Owen perspective, uh, John Owen has popularized a, a particular brand of very, fairly recent in, in, in human history and among reformers. Um, the most debated topic among the reformed Calvinistic groups is the, the doctrine of atonement. And so you you have men like Bruce Ware, for example, there at Southwest uh, so Southern Seminary, who's a Armaldian or a four point Calvinist, who does a lot of work trying to help his five point friends realize that the John Owens perspective isn't a historically reformed perspective, um, nor is it really true Calvinism, because Calvin himself didn't likely teach John Owens' form of uh, uh, atonement and. Um, and David Allen does a really great job of kind of unpacking that in his book on the atonement. If, if anyone is interested in going through all the different views with regard to the extent of the atonement. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of debate over that particular issue um, and what that entails. Um, what does it mean to be able to say that I don't believe that Christ died for the sins of the world? Um, I've had David Allen on several times on my program to talk through some of those issues. If people just search for his name and my name, uh, you can find those there at Sotriology 101 if you're interested in getting more detail. But yeah, there are also different kinds of Calvinists with regard to the philosophical side of things. For example, uh, a friend of mine, David, uh, uh, excuse me, Greg Kokel, a great apologist. He calls himself a Calvinist, mm -hmm. but he does not deny libertarian free will. And that is a very unique form of Calvinism. He actually affirms libertarian free will while maintaining his Calvinism. Um, uh, so I had a, I had a professor. Different I won't... brands of that. 
I had a professor, I won't name him uh, just yet. Maybe I'll have him on to talk about this. And I accused them of being a Calvinist. Uh, I said, but you're a Calvinist. That's the way I accused it. And then he said, no, I'm not. And I was like, um, I, I thought you were. And, and he says, well, I'm a theological determinist, but I believe in libertarian free will. And I said, I'm, I'm not even going to try right now to jump into that conversation. Yeah. But okay. We might have him on uh, to have this discussion, and and it's just again way smarter guy than obviously uh, I am, and, and and knows his philosophy really really well, especially well. His if you're looking if you're looking for like a dividing line, like a here's the bottom line, what separates what I would call a Calvinist, generally speaking, a mere Calvinist, if you will, mm -hmm. versus a non-Calvinist, a provisionist, if you will. Um, the, the dividing line, I think, is the concept of of really the inability to believe the gospel unless you've been chosen before you were born to be irresistibly graced, to be irresistibly brought to salvation. That, that is the basics of Calvinism. You were born without the capacity of believing the gospel unless you were picked before you were born and caused by an irresistible grace to believe the gospel. If you hold to that concept, then you're in the Calvinist camp as far as I'm concerned. Now, you may have different nuances of how you define the atonement and how you define philosophical libertarian wills and all those kinds of things. That's secondary to the major issue. If you believe that you were picked before you were born unilaterally, in other words, nothing based upon anything foreseen or known about you, you were created and picked unilaterally before you were even created to be made into a believer. In other words, God's God's the decisive one who's causing you to become a believer. Then you are a Calvinist, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, you reject that concept and you say, no, God created us with the ability to accept or reject the gospel, then you're not a Calvinist. And that, that that's the major so it logically, difference between it the sort two of people. logically follows based on this one thing in regard because you if there is an inability to believe, then but we have believers, then you got to answer that question of like how somebody would come to believe. Then you jump into, well, he's got to regenerate you before you actually believing and in the rest. Right. Of and it gets into the nuance, the secondary nuances within the non, once you get into the non Calvinist camp, then you can have the secondary nuances of, okay, how did one become able to believe? Was he given that grace later in life? Uh, was it given to him through the cross of Calvary, like the Wesleyans that, that, you know, kind of gave everybody this ability back that they lost in the fall? Or like the provisionists that say, no, it's just the common grace of God that God's created us all in his image with the ability to believe and trust in him when he makes himself known. Um, whatever view you hold to in the non-Calvinist camp is kind of secondary to the major point of, mm -hmm. of what really divides the Calvinist from the non-Calvinist, which is really that God is the decisive cause of your faith. He's the one who decided before you were even born that you would be made into a believer. If you believe that that's the way it works, then then I would put you on the Calvinist side of of the debate. 